Oh, uh, sir. Code red and chatbots and sneaky drivers hiding in your system. These stories and much more on today's episode of MSP Dispatch. Today's episode of MSP Dispatch is brought to you by Cyber Drains Capture the Flag, a CTF oriented at system administrators and engineers instead of cybersecurity experts. This event is designed to test the skills of everyone in the MSP space so that they can show off what they can do. Beginning February 14th, 2023, with no cost to enter, anyone anywhere in the world is welcome to join up to 1,000 players. And to get an idea of the amazing prizes up for grabs, take a look at last year's awards, including a streamer starter pack, a PS5, a Nintendo Switch, and thousands of dollars in Amazon gift cards, plus more. Be sure to visit ctf.cyberdrain.com to register today. Good morning and welcome to the December 27th, 2022 episode of MSP Dispatch, your source for news, community events, and commentary in the MSP channel. I'm Ray Rossini, joined as always by my co-host, Mr. Tony Francisco. How you doing, Tony? Excellent, brother. Excellent. Had an amazing uh, Christmas holiday weekend. Uh, the kids are off now, so I got to deal with them all week and make them do chores, you know, break some child labor laws. How the heck are you doing? Good weekend. Uh, exciting week ahead. Talk to me. I, I'm uh, I, I'm doing great. I, I'm doing fantastic. Uh, closing out the year. Lots of new Amazon toys. You know, my Santa <laughs> is Jeff Bezos. So, you know, um, I, I think I did something because now when I think Amazon and you can look at the previous episode, but now when I think Amazon for my driver, it's like we can't thank them anymore. But thank you anyway. It's like they're not doing the five bucks or at least for me. Don't I, tip I, him because you're tipping uh bezos somebody calls him yeah well yeah i i think i bankrupted him at this point but tony <laughs> I, I want you to do an exercise with me and the msp audience as you're watching because hopefully hopefully you're watching on the uh live premieres that we're doing okay. take a deep breath with me let's inhale exhale your wi-fi knows what we're doing um, so that's, a, that's a, our banter story for today uh nist researchers have figured out a way to measure people's breathing based on how it affects wi-fi signals all right this isn't new this came up a couple uh, a couple of years ago but it required a bunch of devices the software wasn't there yet um, and then recently they figured out how to do it with off-the-shelf routers with one router one wireless device and they designed their own algorithm and now they can actually see how breathing affects wi-fi so they can they can detect the quality of your breathing just by using the Wi-Fi signals. Absolutely mind-boggling, absolutely terrifying, because the last thing, Alexa's already listening to me. I don't want her knowing how I'm breathing, too. Uh, but what? I think it's cool as hell. That, I don't you cool. You and I have different definitions of cool. Like, I, 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 I want you to process what's going on. Let me, let me translate exactly what's going through my head at that moment while you're saying. So... We can, if you look at, uh, if you do packet inspection, payload and all that fun stuff, you can actually figure out what comes over from uh, from a ping perspective and from a delayed perspective, what comes over Wi-Fi versus what comes over landline. And nowadays, everything's over Wi-Fi in houses. Your ISP can detect how many people are breathing. What is the athleticism level in that house? Maybe okay. some sexual activity in a particular uh, apartment or, you know, like that's, I want you to, pro they can do demographics now on not just what you're consuming, how you're consuming it and actually lifestyles. Um, yeah. I'm kind of freaking out. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's the thing, right? Like if they medical devices, medical device monitoring our, you know, watches, our phones getting more and more capable, really cool with all the data breaches that we talk about all the time and maybe sharing information we talked about Fortnite, we have an update in the notables, but the Fortnite data privacy that was being ignored and data breaches like in our top story and information being shared with maybe insurers or people you don't want them to. Uh, this is a little terrifying. You, you know, what's more terrifying exchange. Oh, uh, why would you? I, there's only one thing more terrifying than ISPs staring inside my house and everyone else's house. And you just got to throw it out there. Thank you. Thank you. What so I, let's get into it, Tony. Let's do it. Let's get into the news.
In our first top story, Outlook Web Access SSRF, CrowdStrike identifies new exploit method for exchange bypassing proxy not shell mitigations by Brian Pitchford, Eric Eicher, and Nicholas Zylo on the CrowdStrike blog. CrowdStrike discovered a new exploit method called OWA SSRF that consists of CVE 20224108080 and CVE 20224108082 to achieve remote code execution on Outlook web access. The exploit bypasses Microsoft's URL rewrite mitigations they previously provided in response to proxy not shell. Here to talk about the exploit is Bryson Medlock, Threat Intelligence Evangelist at ConnectWise Cyber Research Unit. How are you doing, Bryson? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, man. Thanks for coming on to explain this. Uh, it seems like we're talking about Exchange every other episode. Uh, <laughs> can you tell us what, well, first of all, what's going on here? Okay. So, th yeah, there's been a string of Exchange vulnerabilities over the past couple of years. La last year, we had Proxy Shell, uh, which was an unauthenticated remote code execution that uh, the the initial access point, because it, it was it was a a group of vulnerabilities. It's not a single vulnerability. There's several that kind of get chained together. And the initial access point was through the auto logon function in, in uh, Exchange. Uh, that was patched last year, but then a couple months ago, uh, someone discovered that the same uh, vulnerability still exists if you're authenticated, and they called that one proxy not shell. So Microsoft didn't really patch the, the underlying issue they just put authentication in front of it. So that was uh, that was patched, but it was something that was disclosed because it was found in use in the wild uh, before the patch was released. And so the initial mitigation guidance from Microsoft was just adding some URL uh, rewrite rules to IAS. Um, <clears throat> that, that and. That it went through several different versions. Like the first one, they they listed somebody found a way around that, and then like okay, modify your regex this way, and somebody found a way around that. So so they kind of went through a few iterations, uh, but they seemed to get it pretty well, and the mitigation guidance worked. Uh, and then they actually patched the issue last month in November's uh, 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 release, you know, the the patch Tuesday. Uh, but then what's been discovered is that the um, if you haven't actually patched, patched your system and you're only using the URL rewrite rules, uh, essentially there's there's a similar um, vulnerability using a different path. So instead of using the auto login, uh, that you can use Outlook Web Access as your initial path, and then it's got a very similar SSRF vulnerability that then lets you get to that second one that that proxy not logon uses, which was a, a remote code execution. Uh, letting you run arbitrary PowerShell using the remote PowerShell uh, service in exchange. So this this new uh, OWA SSRF still accesses that backend PowerShell service. However, it's just it's just a different uh, uh, initial um, URL that you're using to, to kind of get into that that system on the back end. So the what it kind of boils down to is if you did you uh, patch your systems, if, if they're up to date, or at least no more than a month out of date. Uh, if you've got November's patches applied to your Exchange server, then you're good to go. You don't have to worry about this. Uh, if you only applied the URL rewrites and you haven't applied the patch yet, then, then you, you are currently vulnerable. And on top of that, there, there is a POC out in the wild. Uh, I think it was somebody from Huntress actually. They found uh, some attackers who had some of their tools in an open repository. They downloaded it, and then the people from CrowdStrike was able to, they found something called POC.py, it was a Python script. And when they went through that, looked what it did, and actually ran it, it, um, it reproduced the attack that they had already observed. So they had, they had CrowdStrike had seen this attack in the wild, realized it was a new exchange vulnerability, um, and then they matched it to this Python script. So there is a POC out there. Uh, People can find it. It's it's just a Python script. It's very easy. You can just run it, and you can exploit you know systems. So, again, if if you're not patched, you need to fix this. You need to worry about this right now. If you are, then then you can go to sleep and enjoy your holidays. Bryson, I'm not sleeping at all. Like you've you've completely devastated my sleep pattern at this point um, because you started off with hey here's what's going on. Uh, Microsoft patched it. They didn't really patch it. They put authentication in it, um, but they didn't patch the issue. They just said hey. We'll 
snap authentication it but here's a way to bypass the authentication oh and by the way after you shell shock me with that here's a script kitty uh scenario where you can actually just go out and dial, uh, download it and execute it and take care of this so anybody with uh racked uh hosted exchange environments um you should be afraid right now and that is absolutely terrifying is there a a, 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 a true authentic end patch available for this <laughs> issue yeah, yeah. The, the original patch where I said they didn't really fix it, that was last year for proxy shell. Yes. And, and then the proxy not shell lets you get around that. Um, the November patch, the one from last month, did actually fix the underlying issue. So proxy not shell okay. is, is no longer a worry, and, and neither is this new OWA SSRF. It, it was confirmed by CrowdStrike and, and some others. They, they said they, they tried the attack against a patched system versus unpatched specifically the the november patch um and, and they said it does not work on patch systems so again if if you have at least last month's uh, uh patch tuesday updates for exchange then then you should be good to go there's you know, so so ray i'm gonna i'm gonna pass this to you with a quick, quick question but first first bryson um what you're saying you're saying two things um uh the first one is very clearly Stay up to date in your in your patches. Re patch your stuff, people. Patch your stuff. The second one is, you should not be using. I think it starts with an H O S. What what's it? What is it, Ray? Host, um, Stop. Oh, hosted exchange. Does it rhyme with? Oh, hosted, hosted exchange. Most I, that's that's the part that gets me right. Like, <laughs> it's not. Look, nothing's perfect. We're not saying Microsoft 365 is going to solve all your problems. We're not saying Google doesn't have their own exploits. That's not the problem. The problem we keep finding with this over and over again, and Bryson, correct me if I'm wrong here, it's these things get exploited because patches aren't being kept up to date. A November yeah. patch should be in, in effect well, right now, right? Is there any reason not to? I mean, there have been issues with patches causing problems you know, in systems in the past. Even I think just the one a couple of weeks ago was causing from some blue screens for people. Uh, from from December, there were some reports on that. So, so definitely, there are things to consider. If you do need to do some testing, because there's always a chance if you just apply the patches to your production servers without testing them, that everything just gets just crashes, and and then you end up having a bad day anyway. So there's definitely things to worry about. And yeah, you should definitely keep up to date on your patches, and that's that's part of the issue. Um, but what we're finding is just the uh, the, the, all the exchange vulnerabilities that we found over the past couple of years, uh, and there's been several, like there was what, proxy shell, there was proxy login, proxy not login, there was proxy Oracle. I feel like there was another proxy something or else in there as well. But they, they all kind of boil down to the way IES and exchange work together. And um, it, it, it's a very complicated process and there just seems to be a lot of room for vulnerabilities. So there's been a number of vulnerabilities found uh, and almost all of them have been ODAs. Um, I mean, definitely proxy logon, which was the big one in April of last year where uh, the world just went crazy all of a sudden. Uh, that, that was a, a zero day. This, this one, you know, again, it it's, was discovered in the wild, uh, the OWA SSRF. It was discovered in the wild and then it was kind of tracked. People did some tracking and figured out what it was. Proxy not login, that was also one that was discovered being actively exploited in the wild. Um, yeah, I don't say it's it's I mean, you're, you're going to have vulnerabilities and it just exchanges had a bad couple of years. Um, yeah. I, I'm hoping that we're good and, you know, we don't have any more, but I, I'm not going to say that's what's going to happen. It, it seems I'm like we think we're done. I'm just wondering who the who the technology provider is that did the URL rewrite mitigations, but doesn't patch. Right. Because the URL rewrite mitigations were a little more complicated than just applying the patch. But that's our time for the for the episode. We'll leave uh, Bryson's contact information below. Follow him on LinkedIn. Follow him. Uh, he's always bringing. We, actually, this story is because he posted in the ConnectWise channel and the security channel on MSP Geek. So we appreciate it. Thank you so much, Bryson. Thank you, Bryson. Yeah, All right, Tony. I'm going to go grab my uh, Mountain Dew Code Red, and uh, you got another Code Red story for us. <laughs>
or even replace the traditional search engine. And it's put a code red in the Google search business. A few weeks ago, an experimental chatbot called ChatGPT, which we have covered extensively here since its uh, release at the MSP Dispatch, made its case to be the industry's next big disruptor. It can serve up information in clear, simple sentences rather than just a list of internet links. It can explain concepts in ways that people can easily understand. It can even generate ideas from scratch, including business strategies, Christmas gift suggestions, blog topics, and vacation plans. Although ChatGPT still has plenty of room for improvement, its release led to Google's management to declare a, quote, code red. For Google, that's akin to pulling the fire alarm. For more than 20 years, Google's search engine has served as the world's primary gateway to the internet. But with a new kind of chatbot technology poised to reinvent or even replace traditional search engines, Google could face the first serious threats to its main search business. Ray, I'm just going to open this up to you because Google was the flagship of the internet. Um, and there's, there's several layers to this, but we, they even see it seriously threatened by a new technology. Does this mean that there's evolution in the technology space, the information space that's taking place right in front of our eyes? Talk to me. This is amazing. Uh, and uh, the chat GPT stuff, I know we've talked about it before. I, I think this is going to be the Elon story, uh, similar to the Elon story in that it just keeps on giving, right? Um, <laughs> in this case, positive things, but mostly. Um, but, you know, we've been talking about stuff like how it affects uh, people submitting research papers or how it can affect, you know, people submitting articles. Um, and the opportunity for, is it plagiarism if you're just having somebody help you or having a, an AI help you. But who um, are you plagiarizing? That's that's the point. And here's and here's the thing I like. So somebody somebody gave the analogy that it was chat GPT is the present day argument against using calculators in, in high school. Right? Before Ooh. and you're in my day, right? We were doing multiplication tables. We were doing everything pen and paper. Can't, can't bring that calculator in. You cannot bring that no, calculator no, no. in. The first time I was allowed to bring a calculator was like, I think pre-calc. And I'll be honest, I played Tetris on my TI-83. <laughs> but, you know, but nowadays using a calculator is normal. Back in our day, you couldn't use google to research stuff you were not allowed to do that in school well it didn't exist that helps but you know even when my daughter was younger we would reference the encyclopedia britannica and if you want to know what that is i don't oh. like you but <laughs> you know but uh you know or you had microsoft encarta right on <laughs> cd but you know you you reference these materials but you were writing stuff on your and then nowadays referencing online websites is a normal thing Right. That's not. And I wonder if this chat GPT is just going to go that way. It's just we got to get comfortable with the technology. And that includes the Googs. Right. The Googs have got to learn how to handle this. Um, you can't as humans, we default to this is bad, but it's a tool and we got to learn to use the tool. And we got to learn to coexist with the tool. Right. So, so, so I, I have multiple questions. The first, the first one is, or more, uh, multiple points. The, the the first point is, Google was at the top of the pyramid, and the content providers, the news, the publications, etc., were really freaking out. You can't query my stuff for people just to find automatically. You can't do that. And Google saying, "Hey, listen, we're just just sending them over to you. That's all we're doing." You know, and of course, the snippets. Okay, that's that pulls away from the value of the content providers. Now, but now there's a layer. Over Google, there's Chat GPT and other, which will use Google as maybe the indexing, cataloging component that then go back and correlate the data and completely bypassing any credibility for Google. So that's the first point and something to, to think about. The second one is big, big, big picture. Chat GPT is the dumbification of humanity in the fact of, let's say, calculators, for example, um, in, hey, do you, give me 10 phone numbers for your friends. Give me 10. Yeah, I know you don't, because now you just go to the name and you hit <laughs> it. I mean, but but you and I are the addresses. Yeah, exactly. I was just gonna say <laughs> you stole my thunder. But yeah. you and I were back in the day where we knew everyone's number by heart. 
and then we started storing them in smartphones, but we can actually go back to, to IP addresses and, and you know, uh, subdomains and figure out all this stuff. So the question really comes down to what I was going to ask is, are we expanding as humanity our level of knowledge because even though the capacity remains the same, we're letting go some of the things that can be automated via technology. So I'm all about meaningful interactions, right? There's no different than an MSP doing QBRs or doing VCIO. When I'm going to talk to a POC, when I'm going to talk to a, a decision maker, I'm going to talk to somebody, the champion for the company or whatever, I want it to be meaningful. I don't want to, I don't want to sit there and talk about exchange issues or printer issues or password resets. I want to talk about what's moving the business forward. And to me, chat GPT entering the conversation is taking out the is taking out the menial stuff and adding meaningful letting us focus on the meaningful well, right I um and i and i like that and, and it's funny you mentioned exactly that about google i agree with you they like to be the homepage for the internet and for all the news sources they were complaining that people were going to google to get the news sources uh now google's in that position the the tables are reversed with chat gpt and all i can say is but you know we want to know from you the msps let us know as always in the comments let us know how you feel uh so we can go into this uh this next one uh, yeah and, and there's always going to be a lot of issues with this and there's a lot of um security concerns do you know of any security concerns <sighs> microsoft microsoft, microsoft. As Tony likes to say, what the f***? <laughs> so, in our third top story in the security realm, again, Microsoft signed malicious Windows drivers used in ransomware attacks in a story by Lawrence Abrams on Bleeping Computer. Microsoft has revoked several Microsoft hardware developer accounts after drivers signed through their profiles were used in cyber attacks, including ransomware incidents. Drivers certified by Microsoft Windows Hardware Developer Program were being used maliciously in post-exploitation activity after attackers had gained administrative permissions. The investigation revealed several developer accounts were engaged in submitting malicious drivers to obtain Microsoft signatures. Since developers need to purchase an extended validation certificate, go through an identification process, and submit drivers vetted by Microsoft, many security platforms automatically trust codes signed by Microsoft in this program. The exploit leverages a loader called StoneStop that uses the Portry, P-O-O-R-T-R-Y, which contains the signed drivers. Because the drivers are signed, the StoneStop application can delete protected files and stop protected processes. Microsoft has released security updates to revoke certificates used by malicious files and already suspended the offending accounts. New Microsoft Defender signatures, 13779870, have also been released to detect the drivers. Microsoft, however, has not commented on how the drivers got through the vetting process in the first place. Tony, Microsoft didn't answer how they got through the vetting process. <laughs> Do you have any guesses? <laughs> I got some dolphins. What the f***? <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, you know, this is not Android. Android, you know, you submit your, your games to or your apps, your software, whatever, to the Play Store. They have some vetting process, but they are, it's automated. It is quick. There's absolutely the presence of malware in some of the applications. We know that. But the whole point of the signed hardware driver <laughs> processes <laughs> are because these are kernel level drivers that have the ability, the extended permissions to kill processes, to kill files that should be protected. I would think that bar for vetting is a little higher, right? Like, I, you know, they're called hackers for a reason. And um, congratulations for them to exploit something that is so far up the food chain and down the food chain to get where they want to go. Um, but it really, really calcifies the theme of keep your structure intact stick to a standard process and at any point of deviation or complacency something can come in and affect someone else this is one of those scenarios where 
We're seeing it coming in from the left. We're seeing it coming in from the right. We're seeing it come in from the very top where you have supply chain management that may have originated from the left or on the right with just a simple phishing attack or just the selling of a user group that may or may not be run by the FBI, which then uses social engineering to ironically go to the left or to the right. So we are trying to, for the betterment of the community as a whole, educate everyone and talk about the everyday hack has huge ramifications industry-wide. Some people tend to focus on the technology side or the vendor side. Some people will even be a little through education and exposure, talk about the supply chain management and how everything, um, I believe the dolphins call it, rolls downhill. And, and, and it can, of course it can, but it can also come in from all sides. So, so from, from the bottom of my heart to the MSP community out there, educate your customers, educate your customers, educate your customers. The videos I see that from the MSP community, the smaller shops, all the way through the executives of the bigger ones, where they're just talking about, Hey, here's a tack, uh, something on their Instagram, which I absolutely love those stories and the Facebook stories, um, it, where their customers will see that. And that's going to seed the curiosity for the education and 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 steps needed to prevent stuff like this from taking massive maximum impact. So that that's just my story. But I, I sorry, I can go on a rant about this, but I it really pains me that we talk about this every single day. This happens to be the one story that comes in from the vendor side, um, and the impact is huge. But ninety percent of the other stuff comes in from the everyday people like me and you. So. <sighs> <laughs> I know. I, I, you know what? I got nothing else to add to that. <laughs> you know why? Because you kicked me in the face with coming out with Microsoft Exchange attacks, and I'm like, ah, oh, God, it made me sweat. You gave me anxiety from that. You, you know what'll make you feel better, Tony? Give, give me some notable mentions. Straight out of the gate. First notable mention is Apple's self repair program now includes more Macs and studio displays for the do it yourself for fixers. It's time to rejoice. Apple's self repair program already gave people the tools and know how to fix their portable Macs and iPhones, but now it's been expanded to include other devices. After initially focusing on iPhones, the self-repair program branched out to the M1 MacBook Air and all three M1-based MacBook Pro laptops. The entire program recently also went live in some European countries for the first time. The self-repair program lets people hire the tools required to complete the basic device repairs at home while also giving them the official Apple licensed parts, which to complete them. In my notable mention, you could soon be watching Apple TV on your Samsung phone or tablet, written by Asif Iqbal Shaikh on sammobile.com. A few years ago, Apple released an Apple TV app for Samsung TVs, and that was the only way for non-iOS phone and tablet users to watch Apple TV. It had to be on a smart TV. However, tipster Shrimp Apple Pro claims that Apple is currently testing Apple TV for Android phone and tablet users internally. The app will have a different UI from Apple TV on smart TVs. It is also reported that Apple is bringing an updated Apple Music app for smartphones. This is for Tony. You're welcome. And jumping into our community events, tomorrow on December 28th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Build It Better, MSP discussion presented by Everything MSP. On December 29th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, The Tech Bar Podcast, episode number 49. And on the 30th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, the MSP Dispatch weekly wrap-up and yearly wrap-up presented by the MSP Media Network. Hey, I'm Powerhouse Ray. And I'm Super Cousin Danny. And we're the hosts of The, the Tech, Tech Bar. Bar. Pull up a stool with us every other Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern for drinks, jokes, and games with your friends in the MSP channel. So how'd you like today's show? If you like it, hit that thumbs up button. If you didn't, go ahead and hit it three times. 
And if you want to hear more, go ahead and hit that subscribe button on YouTube or your favorite podcatcher. Did you know we also have a Discord where we post stories all week? You can post your own stories and even vote on which ones we'll cover. We may even remind you to install Exchange Patches. As my friend Rich Banky says, make sure to tell a friend. Also, be sure to follow us on social media at MSP Media TV. Have any questions? Email news at mspmedia.tv for answers on the next episode or leave us a voicemail, 833-MSP-NETWORK. Tony, you ever see, uh, you've seen Lion King, right? Let's say, you know, you know, when they talk about Mufasa and it gives you chills, like, oh, yeah. Mufasa, I think we're going to do that with exchange. Like, oh. Exchange. <laughs> 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 but, uh, yeah, but special thanks to Bryson for coming on uh, during his day and giving us uh, giving us the insight on the OWA story and, uh, you know, good news for Apple users. Uh, but I think that's a good wrap for this episode. What do you think, Tony? Awesome show as always, brother. Awesome show. All right. Till next time, take care of yourselves and each other. Be safe, everyone. This has been a broadcast of the MSP Media Network. Hey Bryson, your uh, title on your uh, your name is is misspelled. Connect, wise, connect. Oh, okay. Okay. New computer. Hey, right, you like this? It is amazing. Like it's so awesome, but the power button doesn't work. You have to take the case off to push the motherboard power button. So it's something in the in the CMOS. I know. So I'm sitting there and I've got this whole thing all set up. I'm so excited. I got all the. I got everything. Monitors all hooked up. All the other ones all done. And then I'm like, power. Pow, pow, power, come on, power, reset, no, maybe, okay, maybe it's the, the PSU, so flip it. no, no, that's all work, maybe it's in wrong court, so I'm getting cables, and I'm, I'm swapping it out, and then I take that cable, and I plug into the old computer, it works perfectly, I'm like, okay, now I'm crazy, and then finally, I look in, and I see the light on the motherboard, and I'm like, I bet you if I push that power button, it, and it turned on, I'm like, son of a... <laughs> For a few weeks ago, an experimental chatbot called ChatGPT, which we've covered extensively here on the MSB Dispatch, made its case in the industry's big, uh, I, uh, B to B, let me, let me do that one again. Yep, coming out hot. Okay. For more than 20 years, the Google search engine has served as the world's primary gateway to the internet, but with a few kind, hmm, but with a new kind of chatbot technology poised to reinvent or even replace traditional search engines, Google, 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 hold on, here we go, one more time. You know, it'd be really cool when I say talk to me if you were not on mute, because then I could hear you. You can talk to me, I guess technically you were talking to me. <laughs> I was talking to you. You didn't specify that you I wanted to be able to hear me. You I just didn't specify. To talk to you. I was following instructions, sir. No. Um, so, drivers certified by Microsoft Windows Hardware Developer Program were being used maliciously in hoist. Okay. Drivers certified by Microsoft. Drivers being certified by. Blah, blah. Since developers need to purchase an extended validation certificate or EV through the identification process, submit drivers vetted by Microsoft.